Greetings, everyone. Um, another Kumi session. It is uh, good to be with you again. Um, on the Kumi calendar, uh, we we put that we would be marking uh, the Kairos document, but I think due to the situation, we thought it would be very important to uh, address uh, some of our activism uh, towards the UK and in, in general, learn about the situation there in regards to uh, Palestine. So uh, we decided to invite uh, Peter Shambrook uh, to give us a bit more of a historical framework on why uh, Britain has a historical tradition uh, and, it, and current reality in the way uh, it, it has a certain stance towards Palestine and, and Israel. Um, perhaps before we start the session, I'll remind everyone some housekeeping rules. Uh, please remain sensitive in the comments. Uh, this, this session is recorded. So if you uh, wish to be anonymous, please do so now and turn off your camera if you do not want your face to be appeared. Um, any questions that you will have, please post them on the chat and I'll try my best to ask them towards uh, Peter after, during the Q&A uh, session time that we have. We will begin with a uh, half an hour to 40 minutes uh, presentation by Peter Shambrook, uh, following with some time for Q&A. Um, and then we will, uh, as tradition, uh, during the last few Kumi sessions, um, dedicate our time for some form of uh, action that we want to do. Um, so with that being said, um, Peter, uh, I'd like to welcome you uh, to our Kumi session. As uh, we were speaking um, earlier, uh, Peter and I actually met in Durham uh, before we, before I, I sent him an email inviting him for Kumi, and it was a, it felt like a small world, uh, and we met at a, a vigil that was done for um, Palestine in in the summer of twenty twenty one. So, Peter, may may you introduce yourself maybe briefly, and then you can start your important presentation. Uh, you're muted. Uh, Pete, there you go. There you go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm a technological dinosaur, technological dinosaur. Um, thank you for, for having me um, during this uh, very um, <clears throat> bleak, uh, bleak time. Um, um, I'm very aware of, uh, of, uh, <clears throat> of um, events that are happening, not not just in Jerusalem, but in the West Bank and, and in Gaza. And uh, some of my friends uh, from Gaza have managed to go through Rafa and others have not. So, um, um, so uh, I'm, a, I'm, a <clears throat> I'm a trustee of the Balfour Project, which is an educational charity and um, I'm a retired school teacher and historian, and uh, been involved with Israel Palestine since the 1970s when I lived on the island of Malta and I started learning Arabic there in in Malta actually. So, um, uh, about seven years ago, after I retired from teaching, um, some Balfour Project friends asked me to to um, give a, a short talk to them about the promises that um, Britain had made during the First World War, well-known promises, series of promises. And, um, and uh, so um, uh, I ended up, I ended up um, in particular looking at the Hussein McMahon correspondence. Um, so, excuse me. Um, uh, the Hussein McMahon correspondence was the correspondence which um, uh, intrigued me the most simply because of the, the debate, the 100 year debate of, uh, about it all. <clears throat> anyway, um, 
so I've, to, to cut a long story short, I've spent the last seven years um, both talking about Palestine and about Balfour around the country, but also writing um, a book. Um, and uh, my book title is called, uh, it's just been published. Let me just show you just uh, a bit of propaganda here. My book is called Policy of Deceit, Britain and Palestine, 1914 to 1939. Policy of Deceit. Uh, when I started, I didn't expect to have that title, but um, by the end of the book and the end of my research, uh, it, 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 it was the only appropriate title. Um, so let me just try and give some background about Britain's role um, in Palestine uh, during the 20th century in particular. Um, time constraints mean I can't... <laughs> I can't give you a, a I can't give you a discussion about settler colonialism, imperialism, racism, Christian Zionism, uh, but maybe we can touch on these things in the in the Q and A. So these are just my few first thoughts. <clears throat> the Balfour Declaration, of course, was one of a series of wartime promises regarding the Middle East that Britain made to various other parties. Uh, what is not surprising is that all the great powers of the time made promises. Negotiating and trading other territories and empires was standard great power policy at the time, a well-polished tradition for at least 200 years. For example, Britain and France in 1904 came to an agreement whereby France would have a free hand in Morocco and we would have a free hand in Egypt. The French would take their hands politically off Egypt. In 1907, we agreed to divide Persia, as it was then, now Iran, on the, <coughs> on the map into three zones of influence with the Russians, with the Romanovs. Uh, there would be a, a, a Russian zone, and then there'd be a, a uh, uh, in the north, there'd be a, a neutral zone in the middle, and then um, part of Iran close to the uh, Indian border would be uh, a zone under British influence. So it's no surprise that when World War I started, Britain started to make promises. And as you all are probably pretty familiar with, I'll just run through them quickly. The Constantinople agreement we made with the French and the Russians to start with in 1915, beginning of 1915, where, where we agreed that the Russians would take Constantinople, uh, Cilicia, Alexandretta, and the Straits. And uh, the French would have uh, the whole of Greater Syria, as it was at the time, from the Taurus down to the Hejaz and the Egyptian border. And the British reserved uh, any um, Ottoman territory uh, uh, that they could have <laughs> at the end of hostilities. We kept our options open. This was for then followed immediately by our promise to uh, Sharif Hussein of Mecca, uh, in particular in October 1915, uh, whereby uh, we agreed to support an independent, extensive independent Arab state if, if he and his uh, people rebelled against the Turks. This was followed by the Sykes-Picot Agreement, uh, the Balfour Declaration, and then the Anglo-French uh, Government Joint Declaration. So I'm sure you're all familiar with this. So in other words, during the First World War, Britain promised Palestine, <clears throat> the Palestine region to the Arabs. And then two years later, we promised the same Palestine to the global Jewish community. And after the war, for our own imperial reasons, we reneged on our promise to the Arabs and we fulfilled our promise in large measure to the Zionist organization. Successive post-World War I British governments then provided in Palestine and for Palestine, the political, diplomatic and military shield of bayonets throughout most, but not all of the mandate period in other words, up to 1948. And this 
enabled the Zionist dream of a Jewish state and a Jewish majority to become a reality. So that's that, that's that's a nugget, small nugget of the history. The Hussein McMahon correspondence um, is a particularly intriguing promise or agreement be between the UK government and Sharif Hussein because of the hundred year debate over exactly what was and was what and what was not promised. For the last hundred years, successive British governments and pro-Zionist historians like Eli Kuduri and Isaiah Friedman have maintained that Palestine was excluded from the promise to the Sharif. The Arab world, on the other hand, has consistently argued that Palestine was included in the correspondence to the Sharif, in the agreement. My own book demonstrates <laughs> conclusively, I claim, that Palestine was included in the promise and that British governments have lied all along. I claim and I argue in my book that the evidence, both textual and contextual, is overwhelming. And this from the, the evidence of thousands of official government documents of the period and the private papers of officials involved. So the more I went into these con contradictory promises of the First World War, uh, uh, the more confused I became. And um, so I found myself in the National Archives in 2016 onwards. Uh, and in the one on one hand, I was reading literally thousands of colonial office and foreign office uh, contemporary documents uh, and what they were saying privately to each other. And in my other hand, I had a combination of the secondary literature uh, of books that had been um, uh, published on the topics. And I can assure you there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books, um, shelves of them in the university libraries. Um, and as well, in my left hand, I also had the Hansard records. So over the last seven years, um, in the archives, I took 10,000 photos of colonial office and foreign office documents, 10,000 photos, 10,000 documents. Uh, so that's what I had in my one hand, what they were saying privately. And I spent six, more than six months going through the Hansard records, what the governments were saying. And I went through every single day of parliamentary sittings from 1916 through to December 1939. Every, whenever Palestine was mentioned in Parliament, on any day during that period, I cut and pasted it out from the online record and I ended up with 1.4 million words of Hansard concerning Palestine. I'm saying this because there was clearly a interesting, not surprising, but interesting, intriguing, and sometimes very shocking uh, discrepancy between what the British government was saying to themselves internally and what <laughs> government ministers were saying um, uh, publicly in, in Parliament, in the parliamentary record. Um, so trying to find the truth of all of this was, was uh, uh, quite a challenge. It was also quite shocking to um, see and read some historians and the way they not just um, misinterpreted uh, sources but actually misrepresented sources. But that's another that's another whole debate. Right. So this discrepancy uh, was was what became increasingly clear over the years as I as I found myself handling all this stuff. The colonial office records show that between 1915 and 1920, British officials, both diplomatic and military, interpreted the correspondence correctly. 
they interpreted the agreement between uh, Sheriff Hussein and, um, and the British correctly. And in other words, McMahon himself, um, General Maxwell, who was the head of the army in Egypt, Arnold Toynbee at the Foreign Office, Lord Curzon, who was the uh, assistant colonial um, assistant foreign secretary, and others, um, <clears throat> they all wrote that McMahon had reserved the Lebanon area, the Lebanon area, um, not Palestine, uh, in deference to our French allies. In other words, McMahon uh, had agreed to um, an independent uh, Arab state with the with the uh, Sharif, um, but he had said to the Sharif, uh, we reserve the Lebanon area <coughs> um, for our French uh, friends, our French allies. The, the, of course, the Sharif didn't uh, agree to this, but he agreed to uh, postpone the discussion about it until after the war. Um, in McMahon's written report back to the colonial office, he clearly states in his letter to the Sharif uh, that he had reserved the northern coasts of Syria in deference to French interests. The northern coasts of Syria are clearly the Lebanon area. Palestine is the southern uh, part of the uh, Syrian, greater Syrian coast heading down towards Egypt. I might add as well that in McMahon's mind, the records clearly show, and in the minds of colonial office officials, that there was no real sense of commitment that the promise to the Sharif would need to be fulfilled at all. Government policy in this area only changed after 1920. The government claimed then and from then that Palestine was in fact excluded from the area promised to the Sharif. The basis of the British claim was that in the correspondence, the district of Damascus, in quotes, the district of Damascus named in the correspondence could only mean the province of Damascus. But in fact, a province of Damascus, what is called a vilayet of Damascus, did not exist. <clears throat> and of course, it's very helpful here if you have a map in front of you, because the decision makers and the Sharif, and they all had a map in front of them. So uh, British officials from that time, they knew the truth and they denied it. In order to invent a province of Damascus, the Foreign Office redrew, redrew the Ottoman administrative boundaries and drew a line from Damascus to the Gulf of Aqaba, 300 miles further south, and called it the southern boundary of the district of Damascus. It was a fiction. And it was a fiction which Lord George's Zionist government adopted and which Churchill, as colonial secretary, confirmed in his 1922 white paper. And this policy was based on a lie. Uh, if any of you happen to have my book, um, uh, the map is on page 128, and you will see clearly there the invented line uh, on the map, invented by the Foreign Office, which purports to show a district of Damascus, a province of Damascus, going down all the way to Aqaba. Churchill's policy, Lord George's policy on this issue was based on a lie. The history of international relations, as far as Europe is concerned, over the last 200 years demonstrates that what I call concealed intentions is a normal, typical feature of all great power diplomacy. And the Hundred Year War for Palestine is an ex excellent example of this. I'll just give you five or six quick brief uh, examples of how officials treated the truth uh, very loosely on this particular issue. Uh, there are many more examples, but here are five or six or seven. In 1918, 
uh, when Weizmann, Chaim Weizmann, the Zionist leader, arrived in Palestine, he specifically told Palestinian leaders that Zionists were not seeking political power in Palestine. That was a lie. In 1919, the conservative leader in the House of Commons, Donal Law, assured the House that the government would encourage the growth of local government and institutions in Palestine. That was a lie. In 1920, in April 1920, at the San Remo Conference, Lord Curzon assured French officials with whom he was negotiating that in the Balfour Declaration, he said, the reference to civil rights included political rights. That was a lie. In 1922, Churchill's white paper on Palestine, in it, Churchill claimed that he had read the correspondence, the Hussein McMahon correspondence carefully, that Palestine was excluded from the promise to the Sharif, and that the, quote, district of Damascus, end of quote, extended 300 miles southwards to the Gulf of Aqaba. That was a lie. He also claimed that the government intended to foster some measure of self-government in Palestine. That was a lie. In 1922, also, Lord Balfour's maiden speech in the House of Lords, he stated that the political rights of Palestinians were fully safeguarded, an absolute lie, and he knew it. In 1923, following the fall of the Lord George government and uh, the new colonial secretary, the Duke of Devonshire, who succeeded Churchill, the Duke of Devonshire stated in the House of Lords, and I quote, every provision has been made by the government to prevent Palestine from becoming a Jewish state or under Jewish domination. That was a lie. If we just move forward now to 1939, 20 years later, the British government in 1939 still officially maintained that Palestine had been excluded from the promise to the Sharif, although the colonial office records clearly show that they knew the truth. This truth has never been acknowledged by any subsequent government. Uh, my book claims that this has been a 100 year cover up, a 100 year lie. The truth concerning Britain's policies implemented in Palestine during the occupation, during the mandate, was interestingly revealed afresh in 2011 in a speech in Israel by Sir Martin Gilbert, the late Sir Martin Gilbert, who was Churchill's official biographer and a prolific Zionist historian. And he, in his speech, it, it was to an exclusively Jewish audience at uh, Ben Gurion University in May in May uh, 2011, and it's, uh, it's on YouTube. And in the middle of this talk, <clears throat> he said this, and this is the key to understanding British, the British role in Palestine for 30 years. This is what he said. The centerpiece of British mandatory policy was the withholding of representative institutions for as long as there was in Palestine, an Arab majority, end of quote. You put that at the base and everything else about land sales, about immigration, about other policies, all falls into place. So let's just drill down a bit deeper into what the British actually did during this period, a bit more detail. In July, 1920, when the first civilian High Commissioner, Sir Herbert Samuel, arrived, he immediately implemented Lord George's Zionist policy for Palestine. The Prime Minister had instructed him 
Samuel, a British Jewish committed Zionist, that the establishment of representative institutions in Palestine should not be allowed to happen. So Samuel presided with supreme power over what can only be described, and the Peel Commission described it as a crown colony style government administration. He did so and arbitrarily passed hundreds of laws during his five year rule of Palestine. And these included, uh, these laws, these ordinances included one, laws which specifically and deliberately encouraged Jewish immigration, two, opened the land registration system to foreigners, three, recognized officially the Jewish Constituent Assembly, four, denied recognition to the Palestine Arab executive, and five, established Hebrew as an official language of Palestine alongside Arabic and English. In other words, Samuel did everything to encourage the growth of a Jewish national entity, political, economic, and demographic. And yet he was able to state in a speech to Palestinians a year after his arrival that his majesty's government would never do anything contrary to their social, economic, or political interests. That was an absolute lie. What is significant is that Samuel's policies during those years, uh, which included the um, which included the um, uh, ratification of the mandate document into which the Balfour Project was the Balfour Declaration was integrated into international law in in uh, July 1922. So Samuel's policies basically painted all future governments concerning Palestine into a corner. In the mid-1930s, two factors exploded onto the Palestinian scene. One was the tremendous increase of Jewish immigrants into Palestine who were fleeing Nazi persecution, in 1935, some 62,000 Jews arrived in Palestine. In fact, more Jews arrived in Palestine in 1935 in that one year than the total number of Jews living in Palestine during the First World War, i.e. 20 years earlier. Secondly, the Palestinian revolt, the Palestine revolt, which started in 1936, precipitated largely by the, by the British refusal to allow any constitutional development at all in Palestine, and secondly, the British refusal to limit Jewish immigration. In order to suppress the revolt, the British passed emergency regulations which legalized, and I say legalized in inverted commas, mass arrests, curfews, house demolitions and military courts. By the summer of 1939, the revolt had been brutally suppressed, the Palestinian people disarmed and the Jewish militias armed and trained by the British. In 1939, the UK government finally agreed to publish the Hussein McMahon correspondence. Between 1920 and 1939, successive governments had officially refused requests in the House of Commons and the House of Lords to publish the correspondence. They had refused officially 24 times on 24 separate occasions. In 1939, however, with a global war on the horizon, the UK government was keen to keep the Arab world and the Islamic world on side. It needed to pacify Palestine, not because it liked the Palestinians, but in order to release troops to protect Egypt and the Suez Canal. But in an 
official investigation into the correspondence, the government in March 1939 still maintained the lie that the Sheriff had not been promised the Palestine region in 1915. In order to keep the Arab world on side, in May 1939, the UK did institute a policy of restricting Jewish immigration into Palestine, which was a definite reversal of the previous pro-Zionist policy by British governments. I would claim that Palestine was lost to the Zionist political militia leadership by 1939, i.e. before the Second World War started and before the Holocaust. During the Second World War, these emergency regulations were renewed, this time against mostly against Zionist terrorist groups who were attacking British troops, and the same emergency regulations were then adopted and adapted by the Israeli state in 1948. Those emergency regulations have been adopted and layered on by successive Israeli governments to this day. And what we are all witnessing today is a direct legacy of our British emergency regulations. In 1948, the British government, exhausted by the war, washed its hands, like Pontius Pilate, in my view, of the Palestine problem. It withdrew and it allowed Zionist militias, in effect, to mount a preemptive coup and to drive out a majority of Palestinians out of Palestine. At the time, the Jewish community, some 30%, perhaps a fraction more than 30% of the population, legally owned some 7% of Palestine. This after some 60 years of, of uh, colonization. To look at the other side of the coin, uh, at the time in 1948, the uh, Palestine indigenous population, uh, Arab population, some 70% of the population still legally owned some 93% of the land of Palestine. Ben-Gurion Zionist militias created the state of Palestine on 78% of Mandate Palestine. No British government has examined its predecessors' contradictory promises during World War I regarding Palestine, nor its deceitful mandate policies, which led inevitably to the destruction of Palestinian society and the subsequent struggle for control of Palestine ever since. No British government has ever expressed one iota of responsibility for what happened in 1948. And since 1967, a succession of governments in London, their eyes firmly fixed on the next election, on trade, on oil security, intelligence security, and the so-called special relationship with Washington DC have shown no desire whatsoever to hold Israel, a close ally, a self-proclaimed liberal democracy, to account for its un-Jewish, colonizing, brutal, oppressive policies, which therefore remain consequence-free. Our political leaders, and I'm talking about the UK's political leaders, who appear to be thoroughly uninformed about Britain's past role in Palestine, in my view, are not only moral and political midgets, they are currently complicit in genocide. The war for Palestine started in 10 Downing Street during World War I not in 1948, not in 1967 or 73. The current nightmare in Gaza, the West Bank and in Jerusalem is a direct legacy, one of the direct legacies of Britain's deceitful, one-sided, 
colonial mandate policies. Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer, just to conclude, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer will continue, I believe, to propose morally and politically indefensible policies until they learn some relevant history and receive and absorb more balanced advice about Palestine and Israel. Justice, uh, <laughs> this is my, I, I will say this, justice will prevail eventually, but it is going to be at a huge cost. It already has been at a huge cost and just how huge we cannot predict. Um, personally, I th the, the situation is undoubtedly extremely bleak and my only one very, very, very small chink of hope is that looking back over the last uh, 20, 30 years, or at least since the 1970s, basically, um, over the last 20 years, both in the USA and in the UK, um, there has been a small but growing disconnect between the policies of the governments and the what I call the elites and the man in the street. And um, the general public, uh, including in Britain, I think is slowly but surely becoming better informed, slightly more balanced and um, increasingly pro-Palestinian, but there is a long way to go. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I encourage everyone uh, who has any questions to put them on the chat. And I'll try my best to ask them towards Peter. Uh, perhaps I'll use my my privilege again as moderator to ask the question. So you you mentioned the in your conclu in you in your conclusion that you have a a certain hope and the establishment is getting more and more pressure with the younger generation which on the street are much more pro-Palestinian. Um, but we have seen that in 2003 uh, with protests towards Iraq. Um, what do you think is different in these protests now? And how do you think it can be effectively translated into uh, decision-making policies? That's a, that's a, <laughs> That's a huge question. A series of questions. Uh, it's certainly uh, massive demonstrations in whenever it was 2002, 2003 did not did not stop the war and and and, and Iraq and Afghanistan and and um, are still paying the price uh, for that um, <clears throat> for that huge um, uh, um, policy blunder mistake. Um, um, uh, Uh, I I I I look at uh, I look at this from the point of view of the history of colonialism and the history of imperialism and and um, uh, so I look at this from the viewpoint of um, the uh, the encounter with the Maoris with the uh, Native Americans with the in, in Algeria um, Tunisia um, the French experience because I, I lived five years in France and I've, I've visited Tunisia and so on, uh, and then South Africa, and also Ireland, of course, uh, Northern Ireland. And basically, uh, some colonial, some colonial, uh, European colonial endeavors over the last uh, few hundred years have more or less wiped out the indigenous population, and some like Algeria and uh, South Africa have, have an, an island to a certain extent, Northern Ireland, have turned a corner. Uh, and uh, they turned a the corner partly, well, for a variety of reasons. And if you take South Africa, there is a difference. There, you know, there are plenty of differences in terms of the apartheid regime there and the apartheid situation uh, where you are, uh, Samuel. Um, but basically, in South Africa, it was a combination of both. It was a combination of both what was happening internally. Um, uh, and military pressure from the Cubans, but also international pressure. It was also international pressure. 
Um, but our government, for instance, I remember in 1987, Mrs. Thatcher, our prime minister at the Vancouver Commonwealth Summit in 1987, this was just three years before Mandela was released. She was calling the ANC and Mandela and the IRA, and she was lumping them all as terrorist organizations. Three years later, Mandela was free. Um, so, so I have no idea how long the nightmare of Palestine is going to continue, but I think the fact that um, the fact the, the fact that you have uh, more or less equal numbers, or maybe even more uh, 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 non-Jews between the, the the sea and the Mediterranean Sea and the river, uh, as well as Jews, I think I think that m militates against uh, militates against the Native American result and will be more, I think, like either an Algeria or a South Africa result. But whether it will take three months or three years or the next 30 years, I don't know. I might be pushing up Davies, daisies before, before it happens, but I think it will. I think it will happen. I think it will happen because ultimately in a situation like this, uh, settler colonialism will, will have to will have to uh, retreat and come to some accommodation with the Palestinians. But just how to do it, uh, I think personally, um, I nearly had a breakdown some years ago because you just get so depressed where you see no light at the end of the tunnel. And, um, uh, and uh, so uh, I think the main thing for each of us is that we don't allow ourselves to become so depressed that we just want to look for a knife and slit our wrists we've, we've just got to each of us keep going and trust and pray if if one is a, a prayerful person um and um and and do what we can and do what we can in terms of lobbying uh, parliament and demonstrating and speaking out and having no fear having no fear i've i've accused publicly uh, um in the last weeks, uh, in the in the marketplace in the city where I live in Durham, uh, I've I've accused them, um, I've accused our, our current government of being complicit in genocide, ethnic cleansing, and collective punishment, and um, I'm quite happy to be arrested and go to court for that. So we just we we just have to keep going and and keep targeting our members in Britain anyway, keep targeting our members of Parliament and keep demonstrating. And 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 eventually, eventually a tipping point will come. I'm sorry, that's probably gone too long. Uh, that's okay. I think just because we have a Kumi action uh, coming up soon, I'm going to read out maybe a few questions uh, that are on the chat, and maybe if you can briefly answer them, yeah. uh, that would be great, um, Peter. So the first one is, what is the impact of more active Muslim and other former colonial expats on the shift in UK public opinion in favor of Palestine? That's uh, one question. The second question is, can you dis discuss Edwin Montague? Um, the third, with all you've said so elo eloquently about the role of successive governments and leaders, how do we in the UK use our vote, or are we com completely disenfranchised? Um, I, I, I don't think I don't think we're disenfranchised. I think you, you we have to. Uh, I think we have to distinguish between optimism and hope. We need to keep hope as a as a virtue, as a value. Um, and we can we can be hopeful. We can be hopeful in the medium term and the long term without without being optimistic. Uh, I th and I think that's a, a element of wisdom that we all need personally if we're going to stay on an even keel when we're when we're trying to do our bit with our MPs and others. Um, 
Montague, uh, Edwin Montague, if I remember, was an assimilated Jewish um, Secretary of State for India during part of the First World War. If that's is that, if, and um, if I remember, he was one of those in the cabinet who uh, resisted the uh, Balfour Declaration um, or resisted the issuing of the Balfour Declaration. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, and uh, and he was basically outmaneuvered, outmaneuvered by Balfour and and Lord Milner and others, uh, Smuts and others in the in the cabinet and in the war cabinet. Um, but he represented um, Montague and other leading uh, uh, Jewish figures in Britain at the time, I would say represented a majority of Jews, uh, British Jews who were and had been uh, endeavoring to uh, assimilate into British society as loyal British subjects. Um, but he was outmaneuvered, he was outmaneuvered basically. And and the, the the Balfour Declaration went ahead in November 1917 and was then integrated into uh, British government policy and the mandate uh, system, the League of Nations, in um, July 1922. Um, I've forgotten what the other questions were. Sorry. Um, the role of Muslim and other colonial expats uh, in the change of public opinion in Britain. Uh, uh, to be more pro-Palestinian. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but the, the, the there are there are quite a few Muslim voices, and and there are Muslim um, members of Parliament, uh, you know, who are speaking out now and are, are well received on television and so on. I don't I don't really know what their impact is, though, in terms of uh, in terms of um, of public opinion or in terms of parliament. I mean, there are massive demonstrations uh, 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 around the country in, you know, Liverpool, Newcastle, Edinburgh, Glasgow, uh, all over the place, um, pro-Palestinian. There are also, um, there are also, uh, you know, um, demonstrations um, against uh, anti-Semitism uh, and, and other pro-Israeli um, um, big demonstrations um, in London, not as big as the Palestinian ones, but they're still big. So, uh, so, so I'd say the Israeli, the Israeli uh, embassy and the British Board of uh, Jewish Deputies are are working overtime on the on the uh, the sort of propaganda propaganda war here uh, in the media. So, um, so it's a battle. It's it, it, it's it's a battle. Um, but the Muslim voices are not as um, prominent in certainly in the BBC or in on on mainstream TV as as uh, Jewish voices. Let's put it like that. Not at the moment, anyway. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm afraid we are out of time uh, for the Q and A, but I see that a lot of the questions. Uh, can be a answered by reading your book or by following the Balfour project um, which you're a part of. So I'd recommend all of those who've asked questions or uh, are interested in the subject to purchase uh, the policy of the seat, your most recent book, and also uh, to follow the Balfour project uh, in the UK. Um, so Peter, thank you so much for uh, for your presentation and giving us an historical framework and uh, to the politics and foreign attitudes that uh, the British government uh, has towards Palestine and Israel. Um, and with that, I think we'll transition, Ryan, to um, our uh, Kumi action of this week. Um, yeah, yeah, Peter, go ahead to say Sorry, your just, message. Just to say, if anybody listening would like to be in touch with me, uh, to discuss this further because I feel as though I've just touched the surface, scratched the surface of this whole issue. Uh, please uh, be in touch with Samuel and he will pass on my email to you, anybody who would like to continue the discussion. And thank you for listening. Thank you. 100%. Um, yes, please email me and I can forward you uh, his uh, email and contacts. 
Um, and we also thank you for your activism in Durham. Um, just to, to shout out Durham. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Peter. No, no, Peter. no, no. I'm through. Thank you. Shukran Jazeelan. Shukran Jazeelan. Afwan, afwan. So I want also to emphasize that uh, the truce that has been made in the last uh, few days and the extension of the truce is uh, largely um, and uh, the international pressure, the protests have had a role in it. However, we should see it as a sign to continue and amplify our activism, not to remain comfortable now that there's a there's a few day truce. We need to um, increase our voices for a ceasefire and a truce isn't a ceasefire. Um, so Ryan, uh, if you could share your screen, um, we can introduce the Kumi action of this week. So number one, I can start uh, already uh, by mentioning that um, with, and I think this is in line with what Peter presented, we want to give uh, pressure uh, to labor MPs who have shown some form of critical thought uh, and expression towards Israel, but have unfortunately um, voted, ab uh, well, haven't voted, but have been absent from the vote and chose to be absent from the vote of ceasefire in the parliament uh, in the UK of a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we have decided that we want to put pressure on those MPs. Um, one of the MPs, uh, Ryan, if you can show the Kumi newsletter uh, uh, information, which has all the, uh, there we go, here's the file. Um, one of the MPs is Debbie uh, Abrahams, if I remember it correctly. Um, just a second, I'll bring it up. So, uh, yes, so for our UK um, folk on the call, and even those who are not in the UK, the newsletter we show who we are targeting for our um, uh, emailing our uh, the MPs that have been our part of labor and have chosen to be absent from the vote for ceasefire. Um, and one of them is uh, Debbie Abrahams. Uh, the, her email is on the Kumi newsletter that we have sent you. So if you could email her um, showing your discontent for her uh, action of choosing to be uh, complicit and her to have a stronger stance in calling for a ceasefire uh, and the implementation of international law, uh, that would be a great uh, action with regards to the UK. For our North American friends and also those who have a, a network or contacts with people in North America, uh, Friends of Sabil North America in conjunction with di a diverse coalition of Christian voices have issued a statement where they call for an immediate ceasefire by all parties the adequate provision of humanitarian aid, the accountability uh, of uh, all perpetrators who have ena and enablers of war crimes in accordance to international law, in addition to the um, dismantling of the dehumanizing apartheid system that is currently uh, all Palestinians are subjected to. So uh, they have organized the statement and you can sign it individually and as a part of an organization or in a network. And the link to that uh, open letter is uh, within the Kumi newsletter. And then lastly, um, if those of you who cannot do this um, or wish to do more action, uh, Ryan has put in the chat a few images which we would like you to share on your social media, on your networks. Um, and it's basically emphasizing the point that a pause is not a ceasefire. And we are calling for an immediate ceasefire. Uh, you can share this on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, 
whatever social media you have, you can share it on your email, um, with your church network, with your friends, family. Uh, and again, these images are found on our social media of Kumi and on the newsletter. Uh, so if you can share that, that would be great. Um, I guess with the remaining um, time that we have, I will let uh, around five minutes for us to uh, write the emails, choose which action we want to do, and um, then I will close the session. Um, I've been receiving a few messages regarding um, Peter's email, so I'll uh, re. Um, I think yes. I think um, if you can contact me, prayer at sabil uh, dot org. It's on the Sabil website, and I'll write it on the chat as well. I can pass on to you uh, Peter's um, email, and you can get in contact. All right. I I know that we haven't had as much time to do our Kumi action as uh, before, um, but this is all uh, in the Kumi newsletter. So uh, please do uh, visit back the Kumi newsletter and see our action points. We we highlight them in detail, um, and you can follow our our recommendations. Uh, once again, thank you everyone for attending and being in solidarity. Thank you, Peter, for your important uh, talk. And uh, I hope to see you next week. Uh, we will be having someone from the Armenian community in Jerusalem speaking on the, the situation in Jerusalem. Uh, and we'll have also our Kumi action. So stay tuned. Um, thank you very much for your solidarity. And let's continue pushing for a ceasefire. Let's not uh, remain comfortable uh, now that there's a truce, uh, now that the situation has been going on for uh, more than a month and a half. Let's continue advocating and amplifying all our efforts for a complete ceasefire. Uh, with that being said, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you again, Peter. Uh, and have a continued uh, rest, a good rest of the day. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. God bless. Bye bye, Peter. God bless. Bye. God bless, Thank Samuel. You. Thank you. Thank you.